Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. Psychologist, author, speaker, musician, former professor, and the host of Love and Life, Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Welcome to Love and Life. I'm Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. We've been told to dream big, find our passion, strike a superwoman power pose in front of the mirror, and believe ourselves to be absolutely extraordinary. Well, today's guest is going to tell us to do the exact opposite. We should dream small, stop trying to find our passion, and believe ourselves to be absolutely 100% average. I realize this all sounds very uninspiring, but here's the thing. She backs up this counterintuitive approach with psych research, so this psych nerd was definitely intrigued. So I wanted to invite Liz Forkin Bohannon to the program to share how she built her life of purpose and impact and created an empire that empowers. She's a speaker, entrepreneur, and the founder of Seiko Designs, a socially conscious fashion brand creating educational and economic opportunities for women across the globe. Recognized by Forbes as a top public speaker and named by John Maxwell as one of the top three transformational leaders in the U.S., Forkin Bohannon has been featured on Shark Tank, Good Morning America, Bloomberg Business Week, Vogue, and others. Liz's book, Beginner's Pluck, Build Your Life of Purpose and Impact Now, is a resource for anyone with a dream and a goal and a vision and an entrepreneurial spirit. Liz lives with her husband and company co-founder, Ben, and their two young sons in Portland, Oregon. Liz, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me today, Karen. I want to tell listeners a little bit about how Seiko came across my radar. I was at my husband's college. He's on the board. And there was a young woman there who happened to be a psychology major. So she had done this pop-up shop of Seiko items. And of course, I was struck by the beauty and these Mm -hmm. lovely, gorgeous bags and jewelry and scarves and the whole thing. And I thought, gosh, this is gorgeous. And then I heard the backstory, which I'll let you share with listeners. And I thought, this is remarkable. So I bought a bag, the the convertible. Is that the right? Oh, yes. That is my favorite everyday bag. You've got great taste. The one that's like, (laughs) It can be a backpack. It can be a bat. It can go over your luggage. Yep. Of course, when that arrived and I could see the extraordinary quality and of course the mission of Seiko, I, I reached out to the woman who had sold it to me and I said, Hey, can I host a party? Do you have any reps up in my area? And fast forward, I hosted a party and my friends fell in love with the products. But again, really most importantly is this empowering mission behind Seiko. And then, of course, I just read your book, so now I have even more of the backstory, which is really exciting. And I've invited you to be part of my Women Making It Happen in Their Careers series. So let's just start with how this happened to be your life's purpose and mission. Yeah, well, let, I'll start out by saying the order in which you just introduced that kind of story, it makes my heart absolutely sing. Because uh, I have really, from the beginning of Seiko, known that the mission and the impact of what we are doing, that's the heartbeat of it. And for me, that's like why I wake up every morning to do the work that I'm doing. However, I am crazy, crazy, crazy passionate about our product and about saying like, hey, if we're going to do something awesome in the world, if we're actually going to make an impact, if this is going to be scalable, if it's going to be sustainable, look, we actually need to be focused first on making really beautiful high quality, on trend, versatile, unique pieces that women are going to see. They're going to go, Oh, I want that. And then when they get it, they're going to reach for it in their closet and they're going to love it. And then they find out about the mission and what they're a part of. And that is this like icing on the cake that makes them these like, you know, lifelong kind of brand ambassadors who aren't just buying the product, but are 
hosting trunk shows and becoming sellers and, and that, and all of that. So it just absolutely tickles me. Um, sometimes I feel like people are, um, apologetic about loving our product first. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's you're doing what I hoped you would do. Loving the product first and then totally falling in love with the mission and the impact. Um, so I think you had asked me before I went off on that little soapbox about how Seiko got started in the first place. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I um, studied journalism when I was in university, and I was interested in issues that were facing women and girls that were living in extreme poverty and in conflict and post-conflict zones. And so I graduated from college and kind of did the classic, like, you know, was looking for my dream job and couldn't find it. And I I went and I was working um, in a um, basically like corporate reputation department of a big corporate communications firm. And long story short, I kind of had this moment where I realized that I said I really cared about issues facing women and girls living in extreme poverty. But the reality is I didn't have a single friend who was a girl who came from that background, that my life um, was completely unaffected by the realities that I knew intellectually were facing billions of women and girls across the globe. And so um, in that moment, I kind of, everything kind of else stopped mattering. Like my big dream, like going out and changing the world, like finding my dream job, whatever it is, just kind of became like my new focus in life, frankly, was just like, go make a single friend, like kind of close what, frankly, I think I saw as an integrity gap between what you say you care about and the actual life that you're living. And so I quit my job and I bought a one-way plane ticket to Uganda and I showed up in (laughs) Uganda and just started doing exactly that. Like just literally making friends, building community, building relationships. And through that process, um, I ended up meeting an incredible group of young women in between high school and university. And these young women um, were a part of a college prep program um, for academically gifted young women. There's 25 or 30 slots available a year, and typically like thousands of women are applying. Um, So they're really academically gifted. They go to this two-year college prep program. And at the end of that, they graduate and um, they enter into this nine-month gap. And this nine-month gap exists in the Ugandan school system so that the women have time to go back home, theoretically, and find jobs, uh, make money so that they can pay for college tuition. But what was happening, unsurprisingly, in this specific community is these women were from really rural, impoverished areas. And so they're going back home for this nine month gap. And, and one, they can't find jobs, right? They can't find, um, economic opportunity. Any that does exist kind of defaults to the boys, but it's really difficult for anybody. And then two, there was this loss of social support. So they had spent the the last two years with other like, like like-minded, ambitious young women who had dreams about going on to university and becoming leaders in their community. And then all of a sudden, um, they're back home in their villages and they may be the first ones who have made it, um, graduate from high school, let alone who have, you know, aspirations for college and beyond. And there's a ton of pressure through the form of dowry and bride price to get married, to have kids and to not continue their education. And so, it was kind of this moment in my story where all of a sudden this like huge, ubiquitous, heavy, can't even wrap my brain around it, right? Like global gender inequality and billions of women without access to education or economic opportunity became real tangible, right? Like, okay, well, here's mm-hmm. 25 women, 25 women who are bright, who want it, but don't have the opportunity or kind of pathway onto the next step surely we can figure something out. And so I did a series of different things. I tried to start a charity and then um, just kind of through the research and question asking process became really convinced that we needed to be investing in scalable marketplace solutions um, to help uh, solve this challenge. And then I started a chicken farm and uh, that (laughs) failed pretty miserably, mainly because it turns out I'm not into chickens. And then um, I had... I honestly laugh when I say designed makes it sound it's pretty um it's uh pretty complimentary to what was happening. I had made a pair of these strappy sandals when I was in college, literally out of uh, like rubber flip flop bases and plastic thong, and I tore the thong off and I replaced it with ribbon because I didn't want flip I wanted flip flops that didn't flop. And uh, <laughs> so when I'm in East Africa and I'm just 
hyper focused on the problem and just like, okay, solution, solution, solution. Like, what could we do? Trying different things. A friend from back home actually was like, well, what about those like strappy, funky sandals that you made when we were in um, college? And I was like, "Mm, I mean, fine. Yeah, sure. Why not? Let's try that. (laughs) And so kind of prototyped out these sandals and realized that, okay, I think this is something that we could make with like local materials and conceivably we could, you know, teach 19 year old women who have never made anything before how to make these. And they're light enough that we could ship to the, they checked off a few kind of high level boxes. And so I was like, all right, sandals it is. And so I designed these sandals, kind of set up a really rudimentary like supply chain. Um, and then went out to the school and hired three young women, Mary, Mercy and Rebecca. And I was like, all right, ladies, here's the deal. If you make these sandals for the next nine months, I promise that you will go to college next year. And they were like, okay. And I was like, (laughs) okay. (laughs) And then I came back home to the U.S. and started selling sandals out of the back of my car, which, of course, you know, is exactly what your parents want you doing with your master's (laughs) degree in journalism. (laughs) Um, And that's kind of how it all started. Dan invented it because I kept burning my tongue on my black coffee. And then we realized the perfecter could do so much more. It's the only way to brew coffee or tea and then immediately ice it for iced coffee or iced tea without watering down the flavor. It also brings bourbon to a perfect chill, again, without diluting it or bruising the flavor notes. But my favorite application, wine. The Perfector takes your room temperature red to the recommended low 60s in just 20 seconds. And as a bonus, the Perfector aerates your vintage as well. Check out all the Perfectors applications, including bringing white wine to its most flavorful temperature at drinkperfection.com. Love and Life listeners can use promo code PODCAST at checkout for 20% off your Perfector. I love that you talk about, and you even mentioned this in the book, I wrote down one of your quotes. You said you wanted to be actively co-creating the world Mm. I want to live in. And really, like you said, that gap, and you frame it as a gap of integrity, really, where we say this stuff. And I think people really do mean it. I I mean, I think we all do. But then if we look at our daily life, how many hours of the day are we spending for these global concerns and issues that we claim to be very passionate about? So I love that you just bridge that gap. And another thing I want to share, and you mentioned charity. You initially thought a charitable organization might be the way to go. But throughout the book and through better understanding the purpose of Seiko, it's the furthest thing from a charity, Mm, which mm -hmm. I love. There's this notion in this realm of this white American who comes with all their benevolence, and then the African person is the beneficiary of all this benevolence, and they should be so grateful and thankful and go along their merry way. And yay, the white people came to save the day, which again is the exact opposite of what Seiko is doing. Yeah, I think there's this, to exactly what you're saying, there's this idea that in order to participate, so actually we'll go back to your first thought about um, this kind of integrity gap. We use the word passion a lot in our culture, right? It is very difficult to open up Instagram and to not hear somebody talk about (laughs) finding your passion, chasing your passion, being passionate about something, just go after your passion, whatever it is. And um, it's such this ubiquitous overused phrase. And it's not only overused, I actually think it's being used incorrectly. So a lot of people are really surprised to know that the um, root of the word passion is pati, which is a Latin for to suffer for. Okay, so this idea that you believe so deeply in something that you are willing to sacrifice and suffer for that thing, for that belief. And I think what we've done is we say passion like it's happiness, fulfillment, Mm -hmm. like waking up every day and being like, woohoo, go me, rainbows, unicorns, you know. And, um, and, And so it's creating this narrative around what it means to build a life of passion and purpose that's really incomplete, that only looks at the happy, like shiny side of things and doesn't look at like, okay, but what is that going to take? And what is that actually going to require of you? And so for me, I realized that like I said, I was passionate about this quote unquote cause. And yet I looked at my life and it was like, but you haven't done anything that actually indicates that you care about that. You haven't Mm -hmm. given anything up. You haven't taken a risk. There's been no cost. There's no, no work associated with it. And so it's, it's not really accurate or fair to say that you're like passionate about this thing. Yet I, I knew deep in my heart, I wanted to cultivate 
passion. And I wanted to do something that went beyond kind of this like intellectual belief of like, yeah, obviously, like I want the world to be a better place, but also I need to pay my own bills. And also I want to be able to, you know, buy a new car. And also I want to have a fancy job title. And um, (laughs) so for me, really early on, I realized that like, hey, there might be some times where you have to give some stuff up. And, And here's the thing, in the grand scheme of things, somebody just asked me this the other day, they were like, tell us about like, what was the biggest sacrifice that you made? in this journey. And I couldn't answer it because in hindsight, none of it was a sacrifice. It was all a gift. And it was all the journey that I was supposed to be on. It might've felt like it in the moment, right? Like, you know, I'm 24 and my friends are getting like corporate jobs and they have corporate spending accounts and they're getting 401ks and actual like real job titles. And I'm literally like living out of my car. I can't afford health insurance. Like, but even in that, I was doing it out of this sense and this belief that like we're building something awesome. And like, I get to be a part of that, which is very, very different than like the martyr mentality of like, I'm, I'm the like savior helper and look at me like giving up and living, you know, I was like quite literally living under the poverty line. But it wasn't like, look at me living under the poverty line. It was like, this is crazy. And this is what it takes in this moment. And there's a 90% chance it's going to (laughs) fail. But like, we're doing it. And that is the spirit to kind of lead into your next question about this, like, you know, this relational dynamic that gets set up. Like, that's always the spirit um, and has been the spirit of Seiko since the beginning of like, this isn't an us or them thing. This isn't me coming over and saying like, Hey, I have something that you need. And that is going to be the basis of this relationship. The, the spirit of it is like, Hey, I deeply believe that you are the future leaders of Uganda, of East Africa, Africa and ultimately like of our world, right? Like if you do your job and become more of who you were created to be, you will create ripples in the world that ultimately will affect me positively. And, you know, if I ever have a daughter someday or the sons that I'm raising, like you will be a part of the world that I want my kids to live in. And so by partnering with you, by helping create this gap, like I get to be a part of that story. And like, oh my gosh, that is the life that I want to live because I believe so deeply in you. And so from the beginning of Seiko, we've really set up this mentality of like, there's no giver and receiver in this. It's like, you know, we have women from all different walks of life um, that are running the show right now in Uganda from like the brightest, really fierce, super smart executive level women that are running our team over there to women on our production line who literally haven't made it past second grade. Um, and this is their first job in the formal economy. Each and every one of them are coming to work every single day and giving out of the skills and the gifts and the commitment that they have to give. And they're creating something awesome. Now, then they're making these awesome, beautiful products. Those are getting shipped to the U.S. where women in their communities, um, we, we sell all of our products exclusively through the Seiko Fellow. So we're a direct sales company. And so these women in their own communities are doing what you've been a part of, opening up their homes, hosting a trunk show, sharing their passion for the product, styling their friends, earning an income. And it creates this beautiful community of mutual benefit, right? So when I take our top sellers over to Uganda every year, I get to sit in the room and I get to listen as, you know, Matilda, Auntie Matilda, who worked in a rock quarry doing back breaking labor, earning maybe a dollar 20 a day gets to share like, here's how my life has changed now that I'm a part of Seiko. Like my, my kids are in school. My grandkids are in school. I have health insurance by the way, Auntie Matilda retired last year, which was so Mm -hmm awesome. Like for a Ugandan woman who worked her butt off all her entire life to get to say like, now's my time to get to be a grandma. And I have the financial ability to go rest and to have kind of this last, you know, kind of sunset chapter is a really, really big deal. And so she gets to share like, Hey, Seiko fellows, because you're working your butt off selling our product, this is what, how my life has changed. But then also you know, our, our, our production people in Uganda get to sit and hear from a woman like Janine, who is based in Texas. She is um, a professional musician. She's never sold anything in her life. She um, had her first child and had um, a ton of like medical issues and it was super scary. And she had like massive postpartum anxiety and depression, ended up losing a lot of friends through that process and was just in a really lonely, broken place when she fell in love with a jade bucket bag and was like, I need that bucket bag. I can't afford it right now. Okay. I'll host a show, you know, like whatever, just so I can get the bucket bag. I just want to be very clear. I want that leather bag. And one thing led to another thing. Two years later, Janina is running a team of hundreds of people. They just did a million dollars in revenue created, you know, uh, 
tons of full-time jobs, fully funding scholarships in Uganda. This woman has become this absolute beloved, wise leader and encourager in our community and would say she's she has the best friends that she's ever had in her entire life. And that woman, you know, from like Dallas, Texas, gets to share with Auntie Matilda and with 60 other women, like, here's how you showing up every day, doing your job enables me to get to live the life that I always dreamed about. And it's that type of like mutual benefit that just totally lights our heart on fire. It's a true partnership. And for anyone who's been involved in any kind of social service job or anything related to that, there can be this, like you said, I'm the giver and you're the receiver and I feel good because I've given to you and you should feel grateful and thankful. And it's not that anyone intends for that dynamic to get set up, but it does play out. Except in your case with Seiko, it is truly a partnership. And yeah, I love the idea that this is also empowering women here. Because we we all need empowerment. We all need to step into our purpose and to feel that sense of meaning that we're doing something that does matter in this world. So I love that it's not just, oh yeah, we're going to help these women in Africa. Yay. It's really about women empowering each other in a true partnership. I had a, a woman on a couple of years ago. She she went to Africa. She, I think she went to Ethiopia. She was a hospice nurse and she saw right in front of her eyes a little seven-year-old girl being taken to become a sex slave. Mm. And she was so struck. She started a company called 11th Candle Company in Columbus, Ohio, because then she Mm. came back home and realized, uh, that's not just a thing that happens in Africa. That happens everywhere. And it's a similar story of just seeing that firsthand and then determining to make a difference. And so I now buy all my candles from them because the idea is I'm going to buy candles anyway. So if I'm going to buy candles, Mm -hmm. and that's one of the things I was telling my friends when I invited them to the show, like I, I printed out the card. It's a real cute one. I think it's you with a glass of wine and the travel mm-hmm. bag. And, oh, yeah. and then on the back, I printed out some more of your literature. I just took a screenshot of some other stuff to just explain. I wanted people to know I'm not asking you to come to my house so I can get free stuff. I really don't mm. care about the free stuff. I'm asking you to come to my house so you can think about, especially this Christmas, you're going to be buying yes. all these people things that they absolutely do not need. So <laughs> if you're going to do that, how about we be intentional? And that's a way that, yeah, not everyone's going to buy one-way ticket to Uganda, but everyone can say, hey, I'm going to buy some Christmas gifts this year. I can be intentional with my my money. And that can be my small part, which isn't really all that small when you think about it. It is not small. It absolutely is not small. And that's the thing. You know, I have a, a chapter in the book. I open up the book talking about dream small. And and really, yeah. the reason that I talk about that is because it's kind of this idea that we can get paralyzed by our big dreams. So, so sometimes it's actually better to dream small, be faithful to that, like continue, see what happens. The dream can get a little bit bigger. But I also really think a lot of times people get paralyzed because they think, well, this is just like a drop in the bucket. Like right. it's not actually going to make a difference. And I'm here on the other side saying it makes a difference. And it absolutely yeah. all matters. And we've really set up our company in a way that it's like, if you buy, I think our lowest price point good is probably, um, I don't know, maybe like a $29 bracelet, which is like this really awesome. We call it our brave bracelet. It's like a, a kind of modernized chic charm bracelet. And okay. So it's $29. So if you buy a brave bracelet, that's kind of the, you know, that's the baseline all the way up to like, you know, being a, a regular customer, you could host a trunk show that makes a huge impact all the way up to, you know, being the fellow that leads the million dollar team that's creating impact. But literally we have to have for our business model to work, we need people in every single seat. And frankly, if those people that are the brave bracelet purchasers, they're the once a year customers that come and buy a little leather good. If they stop because they believe or they look ahead and see like, well, I'm not making the impact that she is or for our fellows that are a part of our community that are like, well, I can't ever be, you know, I'm a full-time, I've got a full-time job or like, I'm, you know, I've got three kids under the age of four. Like I can't do it justice. And I'm like, no, it's all wherever you are in your life and whatever capacity you have to give, if that's, you know, buying the bracelet at Seiko Designs instead of target.com. Or to your point, you're going to do it anyway. I think I read that Americans are going to spell, I don't even know what it was. The number was too big. It was meaningless yeah. to me. Eight billion, eight trillion dollars this like holiday season. And that matters so much to us. Like we just launched our, uh, you know, Black Friday big sale today. And it's like, I think even sometimes people are like, well, I don't know, like I'm participating in this. And we're like, no, 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 go all out, go crazy. Like 
we bank our entire year off of like this idea that you're, you're going to participate in whatever capacity in this story. And if enough people do that, it actually really matters and it moves the needle. And so I love, love, love this thought of like, it's not about buying the one-way plane ticket to Uganda. It's about taking an honest look at your life and like, where do you have to give? What relatively small changes can you make in your spending habits to make a huge impact for these companies and these organizations? And I will also say, by the way, you're going to benefit. Like, when I wake up in the morning, you know, my closet over the last several years has become nearly fully Seiko or <laughs> other ethical brands that I support. Yeah. And I just have to say, like, it changes my delight in getting dressed in the morning. Like when mm-hmm. I put on products, I actually just, um, we just did a photo shoot um, yesterday. I just got home and we realized like last minute we changed up a look. It was 9 p.m. And I like was running out, you know, I'm in like the middle of nowhere, California. And I'm like running out to some like big box discount store because we need a, you know, a specific item for this photo shoot. And I buy a pair of, I don't even know what it was. It was, it was like a $20, you know, like pleather jacket. And I just haven't done that in so long. And we mm-hmm. used it in the shoot. So I kept it. And I put it in my closet. I had to keep it. It wasn't even like I made that decision. But after a while of aligning your purchases, I realized like when I see that jacket, it's actually quite cute. But when I see it hanging in my closet and I like put it on, it just like is kind of like, it's like made out of plastic and I have no idea where it came from. And like, because now I know the feeling of waking up in the morning, putting on an outfit, feeling like I look great and having this just like delighted sense of like, not only do I look awesome, but I love that I know the story behind every single one of these pieces. And not in a way that's like a legalistic, moral, you know, like I checked off the boxes. It actually just creates, it sparks joy (laughs) to use a popular (laughs) phrase. Like it really does just make me go like, "Ah, I love this. Like I look great and I'm, I'm a part of an awesome story. And you get used to that and you will see as a consumer over time, how you're not just doing something good for the world. It actually kind of increases your own like joy and satisfaction in your stuff. And getting back to your products, because we've all been to some stores where they have some products that were made and they are buy this, it'll help some people, but some of the products just aren't that cute or they're mm-hmm. styles that really, that maybe they work somewhere else, but in America, they're not really yeah. trending. And yep. so what I love about your stuff is I was so excited to take my convertible tote out because I knew people were going to start asking me about it. Mm-hmm. And then I could say, really, let me tell you about this company. So that's just really, it's nice. And I love that you're talking about waking up in the morning and loving that I'm stepping into alignment of my values. And that does spark joy for all of us. When we live authentically in step with our values, it absolutely psychologically benefits us. Mm, Yep. That word alignment, I think is so key. We benefit when we are in alignment with our core values. When we wake up in the morning and we're going to a job that aligns with the beliefs we have in the world. When we look into our closet. And when we're like, okay, generally this aligns with the beliefs that I have in the world. When, you know, you're in relationships that are like, hey, this generally jives with what I believe about myself and other people. It does create this deep sense of alignment and of peace and of satisfaction and fulfillment. Absolutely. Let's connect on social. I'm most active on Instagram at Dr. Karen. That's D-R dot K-A-R-I-N. On Twitter, I'm at Dr. Karen Anderson. Live tweet with me when I watch my favorite shows, Will and Grace, my brand new fave, God Friended Me, and of course, all shows Bachelor Nation. Join me on Facebook where I'm stepping up my Facebook Live game. I'm at Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. I want to talk a little bit more about your book because I did love it so. Uh, I'm a psych nerd. Uh, of course, as a psychologist, yeah, yeah. and you did not shy away from the research, which oh, I love. Oh, that kind of makes me like a little nervous hearing uh, <laughs> hearing your perspective on some of the psychology and research from uh, someone whose whose profession and academic background is is in that. You nailed it. I mean, you absolutely integrated the research the way I would if I were writing something because you you made a point. And then, of course, my question or mindset, I'm going, hmm. And then early on in the book, you were talking about owning your average. And you were explaining what you meant by that. And I should let listeners know, pick up the book. It's very uh, counterintuitive. All of her <laughs> or all of her chapters basically make you think, wait, why would you tell me that? I've been told always to do the yeah. opposite of that. 
Yeah, when totally. You own, own your average. You got into a description of what your rationale for that was. And I started thinking about Carol Dweck's research, hmm. uh, the mindset research. And I thought, gosh, I wonder. And I wrote down as I was taking notes. I was like, I wonder if she's come across that before. And then like in the next paragraph, you talked about that. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. I love yeah. that. Yeah. I think that that, um, it's so counterintuitive, right? Because especially over the last, I don't know how long it's been, 10, 15 years, kind of the motivational, like self-help lingo language really has trended towards like, you're so special and like you're right. smarter than you think you are. And you just have to find your own sense of being extraordinary and go out in the world and prove that to other people. And it just frankly never really sat with me, or I guess it was just that it didn't work for me. Like mm -hmm. standing in front of the mirror every morning and like, you know, power posing and saying like, <laughs> you are the most awesome, smart CEO in the whole world. Like there's just this part of my brain that I would be like, no, you're not like, you're not <laughs> like, and I can't believe that. But, and so I think when, when the narrative tells us, well, you got to believe that to go out and do something great in the world, it kind of puts this impossible task in front of us of right. like, wake up every morning and just beat yourself into submission and believe that you're like <laughs> awesome. And for me going like, well, what if I say, no, you're not like, you're probably not the smartest person. <laughs> you're probably not the most in inherently talented. Like you're probably not, you don't have the highest IQ, but like, does that, does that preclude you from going out today and creating something really meaningful in the world? Like, does that mean that you're not qualified to go out and to build like something awesome and going like, no, actually, like you don't need to be extraordinary to go out and to live an extraordinary life and to build something extraordinary. Because what I've seen is that building extraordinary things actually doesn't happen because of your inherent gifts or talents. Like, or IQ or, you know, whatever it is, it, it actually happens. And, and people are more likely to do it when they have a mentality of like, I'm just going to go try. I'm going to go like experiment and I'm going to see what works. And when it fails, I'm going to get really curious and I'm going to kind of lean in and I'm going to tweak and I'm going to experiment and then I'm going to go out again. And then I'm going to take some risks. Like I'm actually going to be the person that is willing to go out and to look like a goofball and to fail a couple times. Because when you believe that you are average, what happens is it gives you the freedom to do that. You have the freedom to start trying things that you know you're probably not going to be good at, at least to start off with, right? Because you're no longer spending all of your emotional energy protecting your ego and protecting yes. your need to be somebody that people look at and go like, oh my gosh, she just goes out and she's just like immediately successful at everything she does. What can't she do, right? You're like, you're so over that because you're like, well, that's not the real, that's not the truth anyway. So I'll own the truth. I'll be the first one to say, pretty average, <laughs> but I'm going to be the one that's going to take the risk. And that is what contributes to that growth mentality. And that is the thing that ends up um, allowing us to take more risks, to try, to fail, to iterate, to get back up, um, to separate a little bit. Um, you know, I talk about separating the create, like the created from the creator, right? Like I can create ideas that suck. Like I can build things that don't work and that break and that nobody cares about, you know, that <laughs> flop, that don't launch well. That doesn't mean I'm unworthy. That doesn't mean I'm an idiot. That doesn't mean I'm, you know, bad or unworthy. And so kind of having this line between like, no, 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 I'm rooted in my own sense of like, I'm worthy. I'm going to try things. I'm going to fail. Like, and um, because I'm made in the image of the divine, I have this inherent, this inherent sense of like, I belong here just as much as anybody else. That then gives me the freedom to go out and to make awesome and crappy stuff <laughs> um, without that <laughs> being like inherently tied to my worthiness and my value. Right. And you even mentioned that in some of the research you came across that curiosity is just as important as IQ in predicting success. How and, crazy is that? Right. You're, you're saying, be curious. Will I succeed? And then taking the pressure off yourself to protect this ideal version of yourself that's out of step with reality anyway, by the way. Of course it is. Right. But it's, and it's so interesting because it really flies in the face. And you mentioned this in the book. It flies in the face of about the last 20 years of mm -hmm. self-help mm -hmm. instruction. One of the other things that I'm really struck by is that the self-help motivational genre, it's also very – I mean, it's called self-help – Right. It it kind of perpetuates this like narcissism, like everything comes back to like, have this belief because you're going to be happier, have this mindset because it's going to make you more successful. And it doesn't really speak to, okay, um, how are those mindsets going to affect what you believe about other people? 
And for me, that is a huge, absolute game changer. Nearly every like mindset shift that I've had has actually come out of this belief that it's like, okay, if I believe something about myself, just by nature of like the integrity of beliefs, right? I also then believe that about other people because I'm a human. So if I believe this about myself as a human person, that is also the belief that I hold for other people. And what that means is that when I'm like, okay, I believe that my worthiness is rooted in how productive I am and uh, how this next launch goes and what you know the revenue numbers for my company are, I have to come to task with the fact that like, oh, so then you also then believe everybody else's, their worthiness is based off of how productive they are and what they achieve in the world. You feel good about that, Liz? And of course, I'm like, oh, that's horrifying. I right. don't know. I don't believe that about other people. And so really just having to say, like, I need to have integrity and alignment in my belief. And one of the things that we don't talk about is how much our own kind of self-talk actually has us objectifying other people, right? You hear people say, like, don't compare yourself to others because, you know, comparison is the thief of all joy. One, I believe that, but that's also still really focused on you. Here's another thought. Stop comparing yourself to people because when you're comparing yourself to people, you are objectifying those people. Those people Mm -hmm. cease to become the beautiful, dignified, dynamic, complex human beings that they are in the world. And they start to just be like mile markers for you. And you look at that person and you go, ooh, okay, they're more successful than I am. You get jealous. They get dehumanized because you don't assume that they also have like heartache and heartbreak and and complexity. You're just kind of like, oh, you know, be nice to be that person. Let me chase after that. Okay. So that's what happens to the people that are like, quote unquote, ahead of you. You're kind of objectifying them and making them one dimensional. The people that are quote unquote behind you that are lower than you, right? You're like, okay, well, don't have anything to gain from them. Don't have anything to learn from them. Like they kind of become invisible and disposable objectifying them. So at the point that this message, it's like, okay, yes, we can talk about how self-help helps us, but also just what kind of humans are we creating in the world? And like, so stop comparing yourself to people because it's bad for you, but also stop comparing yourself to people because it's going to create a heart and a spirit where literally you just look at the entire world as these objects of like, you know, this chessboard of like, where do I measure up? Who's above me? Who's below me? And I don't think in the long run, like that's the type of human that you desire to be because ultimately those beliefs will seep through in how you start treating people. Mm -hmm. That is so well put. And I love that quote, comparison is a thief of joy, but I love even more taking it to the next level like you are and talking about objectification. And that's, and there's this tension and we've heard so much about it again, over the last 20 years of self-help. And obviously as a psychologist, I care about this stuff, but at the same time, we've seen levels of depression and anxiety continue to rise. And I wonder if it's because of this alienation that occurs when we are objectifying everyone, which we can do oh so easily every moment of every day by pulling out our phones. So there's this real tension of, yes, I do need to be about taking care of myself, of course, and the the whole analogy that you fill your own oxygen mask before you fill someone else's. Mm -hmm. And that's true. I mean, there's absolutely no way I can be good to anyone else if I'm not taking care of myself. But that can also step into, like you said, narcissism to where I'm really losing sight about being part of the fabric, the social fabric of the community Mm -hmm. in which I live. And that is a very scary place to be because if we get to, to be an entire community or culture of narcissists, that's going to be a lot of negativity, a lack of empathy. That's a really scary place for us to be moving toward. It is. And it is such a, this is, I love this conversation we're having right now because it is so complex, right? There's all these fine lines of like self-care and boundaries that are really good. Yes. You know, like not having, not being in toxic relationships. I am all about that. Mm-hmm weeding out any difficult relationships from your existence and only being around people who are like, yes, go you, who look like you, who think like you, who make you feel really good about everything that you say. Oh, like, I don't think that that's actually best for you long-term or for the world long-term. Like there is a level at which this idea of like boundaries and protecting ourselves and protecting ourselves from hurt or for people who disagree with us, it actually will start to create this kind of like these little vacuums and these little pockets, uh, these little echo chambers, I think we see happening a lot in our like culture right now. And so it is, it is such a complex and fine line of how do we, uh, how do we take care of ourselves and how do we be smart and how do we surround ourselves with like, you know, core community and truth tellers, but do that for the purpose of like, so that that gives us the mental fortitude and strength so that we can go out in the world and do really difficult things and, and make sacrifices and push ourselves. You know, I just like, 
I just posted on my Instagram this morning. I was hanging out with this, um, she's probably 23 and she, um, I had done a little, uh, I had hired her for a project and she was just this awesome, awesome young woman had a fire in her eyes, had this kind of sense of ambition, was really good at her job. And, you know, we were out at this little Mexican joint after the job and we were chatting and, and she was sharing with me kind of where she's at in life and asking for thoughts and kind of opinions about basically like, do I, do I go back to my college town and kind of, do I stay there? Cause my boyfriend's there and he, you know, kind of wants to pursue this more like known career path, but I kind of have this like, you know, fire in my belly. And I just couldn't help, but like, look at her and say like, go, <laughs> go, go, go. And not away from your boyfriend, but just like, go stretch yourself, like take yeah. the risk. I do think that there is a time for, for balance, but like, there's also a time. And, and I ended the post with saying like, if you never push yourself to the edge of your very self, to the edge of your own strength, to the edge of your own smarts, like you're never going to experience what it's like to take the leap and go like, oh my gosh, I'm flying. And that is what like I get a little bit nervous about that I guess in our culture that seems to be like kind of that, you know, boundaries and, and self-care and like slow down and it's okay to say no. I do absolutely think that there's a place, but it's like, but there's also a place for going, but this might be a season of like push, push mm-hmm. and say yes and stretch yourself um, and learn about yourself. And, and there are ways it's like, you know, athletes, I know nothing about this because I'm the furthest from an athlete that you could probably get. <laughs> but you know, when you hear about athletes talking about like reaching thresholds, right. And it's like, okay, I push myself to the very end. I had muscle failure and it's in the act of that muscle actually getting to its absolute limit and failing that then when it rebuilds itself, like is stronger and has, you know, builds in a memory um, and kind of pushes you to that next level. And so I think it's, it's, it's a complex and nuanced conversation, but I think my desire, like as a society is that we are willing to have those kind of more nuanced conversations instead of string, you know, swinging from these extremes of like, you know, just work yourself to death and like never take a break. And in that you matter if you're successful and then the, all the way over of like, never do anything that feels a little bit like it's okay to just stay at home and watch Netflix all of the time and drink red wine and take a hot bath if you need it, you know? And it's like, Mm -hmm. I I don't think either of those are where we were created to kind of live and exist. Yeah. And my doctorate's in developmental psychology. So when we talk about the times right now, I do look at the last generation and there was, I think, coming from a really good place, this desire to protect. And when you talk about the the, uh, helicopter parenting that we saw and everyone got a trophy and hand sanitizer was a thing. And so this idea that you're talking about, and I did a post recently on Instagram called avoidance is so seductive, Mm. but all it does is increase our anxiety because if I avoid and I stay safe, I never do what you're talking about. Take that risk to show myself what I'm capable of, what I'm made of, which then builds in. I mean, we want to give kids self-esteem and no one can give anyone self-esteem. Self-esteem is built when a child or an adult Mm -hmm. takes that risk and then even if they don't succeed, so what? They go, well, you know what? I didn't die. I didn't crumble in the heap. I actually can take a chance and fail or I can take a chance and actually show myself, wow, I actually could do it, which then builds into the self-esteem, which then allows them to have, which I love what you said, because I'm so about this, this mental fortitude is lacking in many of us, because we, like you said, we're so willing to curl up on the couch, watch other people live their lives and never really get after it ourselves. And I'm concerned about that. <sighs> Me too. And I feel like either this podcast needs to be eight hours long or I'm going <laughs> to come to wherever you are and we are going to have a long lingering dinner over this because I completely agree and learn more about how your expertise in psychology is influencing that because I'm sensing that I don't have the background and like you know, the science behind it, but I'm absolutely like sensing and seeing that same thing. And I think to your point of like, if you push yourself to the edge and you take the risk, Either way, if you do it, you look back and go, I did it. I had no idea I could do it. And I did it. If you fail and you wake up the next morning and the sun continues to rise, you go, I failed. I'm still here. Like, and it still kind of makes me feel embarrassed and I get pit stains when I think about it, but like (laughs) the world didn't end. Right. And so it's like, either way you went to the closet and you looked at the, at the thing that you were scared of, right? I think about like a kid being afraid of the dark and thinking there's a monster in the closet. And I love your thought about how avoidance creates anxiety, right? If you stay curled up in bed 
you will always continue to believe like the monsters in the closet, the monsters right. in the closet. Right. And it's not until you say like, I'm going to get out of bed and I'm just going to go look head on at the thing that I'm really afraid of where you get to like move to the next level and move out of that sense of like paralyzed anxiety. I love that thought. Yeah. It's a concern because of course we do, like I mentioned earlier, we do see that that the levels of these diagnoses, and I think there's diagnostic inflation. We also have a culture mm. that now is so comfortable with mental illness that everyone says, I have anxiety. I go, really? Or maybe you're just nervous. Okay. Can, and I can't cure normal. Okay. Can you and I'm depressed. talk to me from a clinical perspective about <laughs> yeah. that? Like what sure. is the different, like I was just reading a book and it was actually, um, it's called the coddling of the American mind. Oh my gosh. Was, I'm reading that book right now. Okay. I was going to bring We are <laughs> just going to be the best friends. Okay. <laughs> So it it talks about how even how dramatically the definition of trauma has changed over, I don't know, the last like decade or two decades um, that it's like, okay, no trauma was a medical, like this is, we use this in these circuits. And originally it was like basically reserved for people who were, you know, like in active war zones, right? Yes. Um, or yes. experience like extreme like abuse, trauma, and then how like over the course of, and I've used it. Like I literally the other day I was talking about um, how I, my this is a long story, but my, my baby like threw up a fruit pack in the middle of the night and I walked into his room and I thought it was blood and I just absolutely panicked, right? I'm like, I'm thinking like, why is there blood all over my kid's crib? And, and I, I heard myself saying like, I think I have like PTSD from it a little bit because for truly for weeks I would walk in in the morning and have this, like, I could sense my heart rate was increasing because I had this experience that I was like, my muscle memory was kind of, you know, holding from that. And I like kind of threw away, I'm like, Oh my God, I think I, that was like kind of traumatic and like PSD. And I was like, okay, there needs to be another definition of yeah. what I'm referring to because right. what I'm talking about is so vastly different than what the woman who saw her colleague, you know, get blown up by, you know, a uh, uh, yeah, that we're just like, we're not even in the same realm, but my feeling is still valid. Like, but it's not like this kind of merging and like heightening and hyperbolic language mm-hmm. that we're using around mental health and like what's normal versus what is actually like clinically abnormal feels pretty problematic to me. I'm doing it myself. So I'm, I would just be so curious to hear from, from you, from your professional perspective, like what does that evolution look like? What do we do with that? Like what's the impact that that's having on us? The impact is very, is very troubling to me. We are finding that people are then because everyone is so comfortable and I'm all good with people taking away stigma, of course. But when we all then assume that our experience is the trauma that like you talked about, someone who saw their friend get blown up by a landmine, that's not the same. And it doesn't mean that what you experience isn't valid. It just means it's not the same. And to then say I have PTSD because I had a breakup, which was bad. It's not the same. And then it puts you in a category of thinking that you are mentally ill when you're not. You're just sad or depressed for a couple months after a bad breakup. That is normal. But because also we've got big pharma coming in to save the day. So everyone gets to say, oh, I'm depressed. Give me a, a medicine, which of course many of them don't work and it's, they are, they make the problem worse, but that's an entirely different podcast. But because we have that force, which is a huge faction and very powerful force in our society, we've got they are very comfortable with everyone diagnosing themselves and running to their doctor and saying, you know, I've been, I've been off for two weeks. I think I need a med. So there's that reality that's part of it. And it's also as that book talks about, and I want to get these guys on my podcast as well. And if I do, if I'm successful, I will absolutely send you the link because I know you'll want to hear them. Yeah. So, but they are talking about, so my podcast, the theme is take charge of your thoughts, take charge of your life. And that's all rooted in cognitive behavioral therapy. So the, the authors assert, that this generation, and I, when I say this stuff, I feel like this old lady who's like, these kids nowadays, but it's not, it's, <laughs> totally. it's really bigger than that. It really is. And you're seeing, and the research is showing now that a lot of this is coming with the generation that grew up with phones. And there's, that's an yeah. entirely different conversation, but it's all, it all plays its part together. But they're saying that this generation of college students, it, even in the last five, six years, where we're seeing the safe spaces and the need for a trigger warnings and people who, cannot tolerate, like you spoke to earlier, cannot tolerate any vantage point or viewpoint that is out of step with in their own mindset. And what's happening is they are then being taught 
cognitive distortions. Okay. And what I mean by that are faulty ways of thinking that actually lead to people to become depressed and to become anxious, mm. which if they came to me, I would be trying to dismantle those cognitive distortions, helping them challenge them, question those cognitive distortions. But right now they're actually being taught these very distortions in the academic environment. Okay. Can you speak to what is the distortion that they're being taught? So it's like all or nothing thinking, catastrophizing. Trigger warnings had to be stated in a law school. This is back in 2015. The professor had to let any student know, we're going to say the word violated, as in someone violated the law, because someone may have felt that they were violated personally at some point in their life. And if they heard that word, they could not possibly handle it. They would go into the fetal position and lose their mind and become emotionally so fragile that they could not listen to the rest of the lecture. So that's the kind of thing where you're catastrophizing. It's like, well, no, it might be uncomfortable and it might bring up a, a, an image that, oh, like you were talking about, but I can manage it. I don't have to be warned such that I have to, I, I you know, if we're talking about violating the law today in law school, I, I, I got to sit this one out. Yeah. So you're saying that the mental message that that is saying is that you are not strong enough or capable yes. of managing that negative emotion. Therefore, we must remove the thing that creates that negative emotion instead of focusing on how do I become a person who can manage that? Is that like the the, neg- the cognitive distortion that's happening? That's then creating this sense of like, I'm, I'm a person who is incapable of, of dealing with difficult things? Yes, exactly. Oh, that's so interesting. And I find in myself like there's this fascinating... Um, tension, right? Because I do feel like we're moving. I feel really good about the ways in which our culture is progressing in the sense of like, you know, there are just things that I think being a part of a society that by its very core is kind of built on white supremacist like foundations, right? That it's like, there's so much intrinsic and systemic racism. It's like, I deeply believe that we should think really carefully about our language and about like, well, what are the harmful stereotypes that we're using in our film and our music and our language and our politics. And like, how do we move away from that? Like that feels dignifying and it feels like progress to me. But then how do we do that in a way that doesn't create those cognitive distortions? And then instead we progress because I also don't believe, like, I feel like the quote unquote other side could take that as like, you know, it's the whole like, well, the liberal snowflake, like we don't have to change anything about how we do anything. People just need to get tougher. It's like, no, you can also evolve as like a person and like take responsibility for your actions and words. But then how do we do that in a way that isn't crippling us, but that is creating mental fortitude? Like how do we stay in the room how do we, I think that's it. Like, how do we stay in the room? How do we say what you <laughs> yeah. said or did? I like that. This is how it made me feel. This is why that is, is undignifying, but I'm going to stay in the room and I'm going to keep showing up and having the conversation. And it's not going to keep me from doing my job and from being a great student or from being a lawyer or from, you know, like whatever, whatever the thing that you're created to do in the world is like, I, I have the capacity to continue being successful and effective while also saying, I think we need to change this. Yeah, it's absolutely attention. And so a sociologist would look at some of the the social infrastructure and the realities that you're speaking to. And I agree, language is powerful. We need to be very careful and we need to be mindful. But then as a psychologist, my point is I can't change society. I can only change myself. Mm-hmm. And if a client comes to me, and I'm not currently practicing, but if a client comes to me, I can't change their family and I can't change the community they live in. I can help them change themselves. So to me, it really does go back to, to, and I don't want to sound like I'm saying that just toughen up, but in a way, yeah. I mean, what else is there? I mean, what's my choice? I can be in, no matter what I've experienced. I've heard this quote recently. I see it on Instagram and I, I love it. You know, whatever happened to you wasn't your fault, but you're healing and you're empowering yourself to move forward from that dark place, whether it was a straight up PTSD or a violation of any sort or abuse, the, the responsibility is on you to, to create a life despite all that. That sounds so insensitive, but to me it doesn't. It sounds empowering because I believe you can. Okay. That is the key. I think what you just said is that it sounds like you're being a jerk, but what you're actually doing is saying, I believe in you. And we have like, this is so often, I mean, I think about to the very, very, very early days of my company. 
um, in Uganda. So I'm like trying to, you know, create a manufacturing company in the middle of East Africa. And, you know, we have like production lines and basically people have to be at work on time for what we do to work. Because if one person doesn't show up, the whole line gets, you know, kind of screwed up. And I remember people telling me like, that's not going to work here. Like, that's not going to work here. Like you can't expect that people are going to be here at 8.30 AM. And that's just like, that's not a thing. You can't do it. And these were all people that, you know, like had very good hearts and were like, if you want this to work and you really want to like, you know, create this space for Ugandans, like you, you just like can't expect that. And I remember kind of thinking like, huh? Like, what is the message? Like when I'm looking at a 19 year old woman and I'm going, I literally think you could be the first female president. Like, I think you are so (laughs) smart. You're so like gritty. You have so much perseverance. Like you're just brilliant. I really believe that you're going to go on to be a change maker. But then I'm also like, but I don't know that I can ask you to get to work on time at 830 every day. Like, what is the message that I'm sending to that young woman about like her ability to like, yes, traffic gets terrible when it rains and like, yes, like stuff comes up and cars break down, but it's just like, but what is the message that I'm actually sending? It's that like, well, I don't actually believe in you enough to to think that you could get to work on time and communicate when what I deeply believe is like, yeah, you're brilliant and you can do way harder stuff than that. So actually I'm going to set that bar and I'm going to be really unapologetic about it. Not because I'm a mean boss and not because I don't have any grace, but because I believe that about you and I want you to believe that about you. And just like how sometimes I feel like the soft answer that we give of like, you're totally fine. Just accept it. You know, like you can't expect more out of yourself is actually, yeah. Perpetuating this message of like, you can't do that. Like you're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. You're not in control enough. And sometimes I do feel like the most loving thing that we can do is say like, no, you have this in you. I see it. Like I see it in you and I want to push you and challenge you to do that. And I even bristle against the term tough love because, you know, what you're talking about is so, I mean, managing a group of people or being a leader in any capacity and parenting, it's all very, it's all wrapped up together, the the skill set and and the dynamics therein. But I don't even like the term tough love. It's not tough love. It's just love. Mm, Is it loving for me to believe the worst in someone, to see them in their weakest moment and think, yeah, that's probably all you're capable of. Just stay there. Yeah. Okay. No, it's loving to believe... Despite all that, I see in you strength. I see in you abilities. And maybe I can see them for you for now, even if you can't feel them in yourself. And that's, it's it's just, it's really troubling right now because it does, it seems like we're very comfortable vilifying someone who takes a different stance. And so, like I said, when someone takes this, hey, we can do this, you can do this, we all can do this, we're capable. It's, you're minimizing my pain. You're not validating my legitimate experience and my truth and and see, so then I come off the jerk again. <laughs> so. That is so fascinating. So fascinating. Yeah. So you're saying you like are even seeing this just on like a clinical basis with your like with your patients and with like the actual kind of like healing process. I see because I don't have clients right now that I see, but um, because I was a professor, I was a therapist okay. years ago. Okay. But yeah, my master's is in clinical psych, so then of course I have a l- lot of interest in that, and like I yeah. said, the cognitive behavioral stuff. Mm-hmm. And I do see this in the space that I'm on in Instagram because there's a lot of mental health professionals, and yeah. I do see a lot mm. of this. Everyone just being cool. And listen, I'm not trying to say getting a diagnosis sometimes is absolutely the appropriate thing. And it can be very comforting Mm -hmm. to know, oh, wait, there is a treatment plan for this. And that's empowering, right? Because I, someone else has walked through this. They felt what I felt. They've had what I have. And they've, there is a, there's a protocol and there is hope. So I'm not trying to say that I'm not trying to say that there's never a place for it. But right now we're in a space where everyone is so comfortable getting a diagnosis. And that to me is crippling. Because if I go, I'm depressed, I guess my neurotransmitters are off. There's a ton of misinformation about that as well, but that's again another podcast episode. But I'm depressed, I'm I'm chemically depressed, I'm always gonna be depressed. I can only expect of myself that which I could expect from a depressed person. That is the least empowering message I can even imagine telling someone. That is so interesting. So interesting. Yep. (laughs) Wow. Okay, Liz, we could go on for a very long time. Where are you based? (laughs) Um, I'm just outside Chicago. Oh, okay. Well, my mom lives in Chicago, so maybe sometime we'll get to meet in person and, and I have would... long, lingering, interesting. Because I, I feel like I'm leaving this going like I just feel in some ways like yes, and then in other ways I have more questions <laughs> than even when I started. But man, this is a this is a really interesting and relevant uh, conversation right now, and I'm super grateful that you're also thinking about it and 
in your own capacity and in um, the work that you're doing are kind of thinking about what, what is the best, most beneficial to all parties, like mentalities and mindsets and beliefs that we're like setting up and in, in creating so that we can all continue to go out into the world and um, do what we were, what we were made to do. Yeah. And you know, I'm calling this episode empires that empower because I feel that that's what you've created. Seiko is an empire that's empowering. And just to leave listeners on a real nice positive note, I love uh, Liz's journey. You see what she's about and what she's built and her raison d'etre. But if you have a dream or a goal or another kind of hustle that's on your heart, her book will absolutely inspire you. So it doesn't have to be that you're interested in Africa or yeah. in purses or shoes or yeah. jewelry. I just want to let people know that what you're bringing to the reader in your book is it crosses any kind of genre, any kind of dream goal desire you have. Tell them about the magic wand exercise. Oh yeah. So it was so fun because we use this a lot in our company, but that young woman that I was telling you about, I actually, at the end of that, encouraged her to do a magic wand session just for her own personal life. And so here's what a magic wand session is. A magic wand um, session is when you create a specific space um, for people, maybe it's just for yourself, maybe it's for you and your spouse, maybe it's for you and your team, maybe it's for you and your family. And you create these rules where you are not allowed to talk about the how. You are only allowed to talk about the wow. Okay, so what you do is you yeah. start out by saying, okay, if I had a magic wand, and what that does is it just kind of gets everybody in the room on the same page and like, listen, it's it can be out there, it can be wild, it can be like, we don't have to figure out, do we have the time, do we have the money, who's going to be responsible for it, is that possible? You literally just create the space to let yourself dream and let the things that would really make your heart beat a little bit faster and make you go like, oh, wouldn't that be so cool? But we are just so often, the minute our brain goes, oh, wouldn't this be neat? The other side of our brain comes in and goes, you already tried that, you idiot. And it didn't work. Or you don't have enough money. Or like your husband's never going to go for that. Or, you know, your kids are going to think that's stupid. Or your team isn't experienced enough. Or like, it's just, we so quickly take these really beautiful, sacred little like dreams of wow. And then we hack them to death before they even can like take their first big breath with, with the how. And so it's really just about how do you create a spirit of wow, of dreaming, knowing that like, obviously if it ever moves out of wow, like you're going to have to figure out how it happens. And you might even take that idea that came out of the wow session and you might have to scale it back a little bit. You might have to say, okay, we're going to have to start small over here, but at least you gave yourself the space to let the wow kind of come to life. And then one of my favorite things about the wow session that you have to do is that, so the speaker gets to say, okay, if I had a magic wand and they get to go, you know, talk about whatever their like amazing dream is, and then everybody else. So whether that's around the Thanksgiving dinner table or whether that's in your team meeting or whether it's just, you know, you and your spouse out for a date, whoever that person is, everybody has to lean in and they have to look at you. And the only thing that they're allowed to say is, and what it, it does is it just creates the spirit of like, I'm not afraid to like look stupid and dream too big. Like I'm going to have a, a, um, you know, I did improv when I was in high school and it was like actually quite transformative to me. And one of the rules of improv is that, um, you have to say yes. And right. right. So if someone comes out onto a scene and they say like, here we are on the beach and oh my gosh, a, a great white shark is coming for us. The only thing that your teammate can say to that is yes. And I'm, you know, like yeah. what they have to build on to the scene or it doesn't work. And so that spirit of just like, yes, anding, yes, and yourself, yes, and your teammates, like, yes, and your spouse. And it does, you're not signing anything. You're not signing a contract that like, yes, we're going to be able to get this idea off the ground in the next 90 days, but you are giving yourself the energy and the spirit and the freedom and the courage to just like do the thing. And the thing is just dreaming about the thing and letting yourself like letting your mind wander a little bit about what the possibilities are. Because so many people feel like, well, I'm just playing the, the cards that I was handed, you know? And I like hear people right. all the time. They're like, well, I can't do that. You know, I've got like, I've got this or I've got that. I've got a mortgage. I've got a car payment. I have a job. I've got this. And it's like, make no mistake. You chose all of that. You know, like there are right. things that you can't change, right? Like you have a terminally ill child and it's like, yes, 
okay, that is a, th- those are cards that you were dealt and like, you can't wake up tomorrow and change that. But the way that people talk about their lives, so much of it is they talk about it kind of like, I, I, this is just how it is and how the world works. And I kind of just have to like play along with it. And I'm on the treadmill and it's going. And it's just like, you literally created that treadmill. Like you right. literally every day are making an active decision to wake up and to step back on it. It feels like autopilot. It feels like you don't have a choice because you're so used to it and you're surrounded by other people that are making the exact same decision. But make no mistake, you are doing that to yourself. Like you are choosing those constraints. You are choosing those things that are, um, that are changing, you know, your thought process and and how, and the decisions that you're making. So let's just get very real about like, if you're choosing that, you could also choose this, but you've got to do something to like break the cycle. Like you've got to do something to get yourself into a mentality where you can even possibly imagine that it could look differently. And so that's what a a magic wand session is really good for. I was reading that and my husband and I were in the plane. We were traveling for his business this week and I was reading that or last week. And, uh, I looked at him and I was like, we're going to do this. And the kids come home for Thanksgiving because, uh, <gasps> he's got kids. I'm a stepmom and I thought this will be so fun because we'll learn something about each other. Yes. And just through the process of saying, wow, we're going to, even without realizing it, we're going to be supporting one another's dreams and visions. And I just thought that'll be so fun to do. So thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing that with the listeners. And thanks for your time today. I am so inspired. I know the listeners will be inspired. Liz, where can they learn more about Seiko, learn more about you, all your social media stuff, and then also if you're speaking anywhere or where can they grab the book, all of it? Yeah, absolutely. So you can go, um, you can follow me on Instagram, just at Liz Bohannon is where I'm usually most active. I'm on Facebook as well. And then our company, Seiko, it's S-S-E-K-O Designs. And we're on um, Facebook and Instagram as well. We're at SeikoDesigns.com, which is where you can go and learn more in depth about what we're doing and our, our catalog and what awesome products we've got and events that are happening. And then, yeah, I am, I've got a pretty packed out year of 2020. So I'm going to be on the road and speaking and you can um, find my speaking schedule on lizbohannon.co. Um, and if I'm ever in your city, I would love to meet you in person and um, stay connected. Thank you so much. I feel the same. I just am really excited to have hosted a trunk show and I would like to host an online party for any listeners who want to make some ethical consumerism happen this Christmas shopping or I love that. Those online parties, you know, you put the babies to bed, pour a glass of wine hop on, do some online shopping. They're so fun. You'll get to learn about the mission. You'll get to buy awesome gifts. Um, So it would be really, really, really fun uh, to do an online trunk show. Again, so thank you so much, Liz. I really appreciate your time and I'm excited to support what you're doing by letting people know about Seiko. And uh, yeah, just thanks again. Likewise, so energized and inspired and intrigued by our conversation. So thank you so much for your time and expertise and thoughtfulness and for inviting me on this space. The love and life hack for this week is dream small, stop trying to find your passion, and own your average. And for any of you who are interested in supporting Seiko's mission and buying some extraordinarily gorgeous products from the Seiko design team, check out my stories. I'll be putting a link to a show and I'm going to give, normally hostesses get a little bonus perk, but what we'll do is everyone who purchases anything will then be put into a pool and we'll pick the winner. So by making a purchase, you not only support women's educational and vocational opportunities in Uganda and here, you also get the chance to get a little extra swag yourself. Join me in some intentional ethical consumerism this holiday season. As always, thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing the podcast with your friends and for subscribing and rating episodes and reviewing them. This all makes a huge difference and it means so much to me. Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. This is Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. And until next time, make it a great week. Love and Life is produced by Tim May and hosts and executive producer, Dr. Karen Anderson-Abril.